That's right. This is the Pre-Game Engineer Tailgate Mayor Racing Podcast, episode number 46. For Tuesday, April 26, 2016, I'm Tailgate Mayor Rusty Wallace. Joined, as always, in the PETM Podcast Studio by Pre-Game Engineer... To- uh, whoa, I messed that up. Pre-Game Engineer, Andrew Sherwin. Take two. What's up, buddy? Yeah, we're all doing a mistake or two. Welcome <laughs> to the fastest growing podcast on the internet. I think you're going to enjoy tonight's episode. We have a special guest, whether you've been searching around on Twitter or not. Uh, if you haven't, you uh, don't know, and you'll be surprised. And we're going to have us some fun, as always. Sherwin, what you drinking? I am drinking Jim Beam Honey and Club Soda I stole from your wife. Ooh, did you bring the Jim Beam Honey over? I did. Oh, nice. Nicely done. Do you have it with you? In a minute, I will. Ooh, all right. <laughs> and we need to finish it off because there ain't much left of it. Yeah, that sounds pretty tasty. Well done. Well, I was at uh, I was at the old Kroger. And I could not help myself when I I was like, oh, I need just just I need to just grab some Miller Lights. Got some Miller Light, a little light, light little sir. deal, and long neck bottle. bottle. Let wouldn't let go, go of my hand. my hand. So uh, yeah, I went and got me some long neck Miller Light. Keeps playing my song it was a beautiful again. deal. So, yo, yeah, it's hard to ignore the old Miller Light long neck. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So anyway, episode number forty six, dude. So. That's uh, we're we're bull spit. There's bull no spit. way we done forty six. I know of these we're things. steadily creeping up. Hey, our one year anniversary is coming up. We need to do a birthday party and I invite everybody. No, what do you think? Yes. Yeah, pool party. Maybe should we <laughs> should we do it at Charlotte Motor Speedway? <laughs> <laughs> uh Oh, that like might have been a big like ask, it. but <laughs> that's when well, it will be. By the way, because our very first episode was the weekend after the Coca Cola six hundred. Well, before we get there. We got to get through number 46, and 46, we'll drop a little knowledge, and it's not like old Rusty just knew this stuff off the top of my head. I went searching for 46 and found some cool stuff, dude. Number 46 car was driven in the 1950s by a fella named Speedy Thompson. Speedy, what a hell of a name. <laughs> he, I mean, there's some good was, nicknames dude. back in the day. Yeah, I, that old... wasn't even a nickname. I think his name was actually was Speedy. Speedy. That's just what they like. Speedy Gonzalez, Speedy Thompson. Hey, that's high five that, that dude's that dad. Yeah, back in the 1950s, he had eight wins in 75 races in the number 46 car. And, uh, and actually, that was in the Cup Series? Yeah. Wow, that's yeah. awesome. Yeah, Grand National. Grand National yes, Stock Car Racing. And he died in 1972. Uh, he had a heart attack in the race car. They said he went out in the race car. He wasn't feeling too well that day, but they said, he said, I'm going racing anyway. And his car came to a stop in the middle of the, uh, in the, middle of the race, and they, they go and look at him, and he's dead as a doornail. DOA. <laughs> yeah. So, wow, uh, hey. What a way to go. That's how I want to go. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> in that's a race crazy. Car. Yeah. That's crazy. Yeah. He is, uh, he's evidently from Georgia. He's in the Georgia Automobile Hall of Fame. So, cheers to you, Speedy Thompson. At a boy. Yeah, I'll have a drink to Speedy Thompson. <laughs> uh, Sherwin's got a number forty six for us. As oh, well. round near and dear to our hearts, us. Uh, what do we want to call it? Uh, the Millennium with no name, or, or no, the Generation with no name, or the folks that you know were teenagers when Days of, or not quite teenagers when Days of Thunder came out. In case y'all didn't remember, the original Day Glow Green and Yellow Chevy City. Chevrolet, driven by Cole Trickle, was, in fact, number 46. Ooh, that's a great piece of little trivia right there. That's a good trivia for your regular old trivia night at the at the bar or something. Yeah, that's a good bar trivia. Also, it looks like, based on what I saw on the old Periscope here, Ashley Stang's family's race team number is also 46. Oh, very cool. Very cool. So, good to have Ashley on the PC. Smashley, posse. drink one up. We just <laughs> shouted you so. out in the... Like, intro segment of the show. That's right. Well, as always, we're going to give you a quick update on the PETM podcast car. We've got Kenny Smith driving the 24K PETM podcast car out there, Lee County Speedway in Iowa. And uh, Dude's a top 10 machine. He is a machine. Just improved on that ninth place finish last week. We had a sixth place finish in the PETM podcast car this week. He's doing it live on Periscope. It's so cool to be able to watch that. It's so much fun. I'm, I'm on the edge of my seat. <laughs> And and our esteemed producer, who's with us tonight, uh, by the way, the Frizz Eleven, she's um, she's making fun of me. She's posting pictures of me on on Twitter of me uh, sitting at a restaurant uh, watching the whole race on on my iPhone uh, over Periscope. We'll be at a nice restaurant, and I'm sitting there going, "Come on, Kenny, had a boy." So real fun watching Kenny. Sixth place on Friday night, seventh place on Saturday night. Can't ask for any more fun than that. 
Well, until. Until. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. he decides to start showing us the later programs, uh, the faster car, the, the super late model dirt cars. And they had yep. to red flag the race. What did they have to red flag the race for, Rusty? Uh, I believe uh, it was something. <laughs> was it a barn and a mule? <laughs> yeah, they had a they had a, a sheep out there running across the track. Kenny had the perfect view of it. <laughs> it couldn't I help a damn but sheep out on the track, and Kenny's giving the perfect like on the spot, unplanned commentary as the thing runs across the track and like into the paddock area. <laughs> <laughs> that was uh that was too much fun and i tell you what two weeks in a row so last week we had the epic fight this week we got the sheep who knows what's next week like how are you not going to watch that thing you gotta watch that says, on periscope like, if kenny's periscoping the races he's not participating in or if his girlfriend <laughs> is partic- is periscoping the things he is participating in you gotta watch because it's it's real iowa dirt tracks are real <laughs> yeah well, uh, this whole episode, we've been teasing it, man. We've got a special guest. We do. Yeah, so let's uh, let's see. Let's bring him on right here. Let's go ahead well, and bring folks, him without in. further ado, Sherwin and I are excited to have on the show Tommy Joe Martins, a driver of the number 44 Diamond Gusset Gene Chevy in the Camping World Truck Series. Tommy, why don't you say hey to the PETM Posse? How are you doing today? Man, I'm doing great, guys. Thanks a lot for, uh, for having me on the show. Man, the thanks, the thanks, the thanks, the thanks is all on this side, but uh, we're we're having a blast. You know, uh, Sherwin and I always start uh, every interview, every show the same way. Sherwin, what's that? Uh, well, Tommy, what you drinking? I'm drinking a Bud Light. Uh, I was <laughs> Attaboy. talking to That's you guys good. earlier. I just I just got off work uh, from over there at the uh, Ron Fellows Performance Driving School. Just got home. Just got uh, showered, cleaned up. Uh, I'm excited to talk to you guys. So I'm sitting here by this little pool we got here at our house, and I am drinking a beer. Um, not my first beer of choice, um, but I'm still drinking a beer. So it's a gorgeous day out here, too, so it's it's hard to complain. Well, that's awesome. And, yeah, sometimes the best beer is whatever's in the bottom of the fridge. Heck with it. <laughs> yeah, I stole it from my roommate, so it's free. Oh, so that's, yeah, yeah that's free beer's the best beer. beer. That's, a, that's a good type of beer. Ain't no doubt. And you're coming off some uh, tonsil surgery, that sort of deal, so that's a good medicine, too, for the uh, back of the throat, no <laughs> doubt. <laughs> yeah, that's, let's, not, let's not show this to the doctor. Uh, let's not let's not have, let him tune it in. I don't know how much he'd like this, but <laughs> I'm actually feeling a lot better, guys. Uh, you know, it's really good. This has kind of been the first week that I've started to feel a whole lot better. I was pretty pretty under the weather there for a couple of weeks. It really kicked my butt. But, you know, after talking to everybody about that surgery and getting a tonsillectomy when you're going on 30 years old, apparently that kicks everybody's butt. So I wasn't the only one. Well, we're glad you're back in business. And really, I, not only that story, but you've got a hell of a story even getting into the series. And I think it's unique among a lot of the drivers, especially if you go on the website, TommyJoeMartins.com. Uh, but I wonder if you could give us a little rundown of what got you into racing, how you got to where you are today. Uh, man, uh, well, yeah, uh, it's, <laughs> it's one of those things where I kind of fell into it. Um, I, it was something I always wanted to do. Uh, I just always believed since I was a little kid that I could, I could be a pro race car driver. I just, this is one of those things nobody ever taught me. Nobody in my family ever raced or anything like that. It's just something that I just always believed I could do. And when I got a, a chance to run go-karts when I was younger, um, around 16, 17 years old, had a lot of success, ran uh, kind of locally and nationally uh, with go-karts, and then kind of wound up giving it up uh, to go to college. Uh, I was going to be like everybody else and go to college and get a job. I was actually trying to get into journalism and cover racing. That's really what I was trying to do. <laughs> uh, awesome. But while I was kind of in the middle of college, um, my dad had the opportunity to kind of go racing again. His business started doing a little bit better. And so we were able to start running, uh, actually, sports cars. I ran a 350Z uh, in SCCA just for fun. And we started having a whole lot of success. And it seemed like I, I did have some talent for it. And what I'd always wanted to do was, was stock cars. I just, I've always loved NASCAR. I've always wanted to be around it. In fact, when I was 17 years old, after I'd been running go-karts, my dad took me to a performance driving school. And we asked, you know, the guy said, well, what, what's your dream uh, in racing? And I said, man, if I could run the ARCA race at Daytona one time, I think that would be <laughs> awesome. And that's a true story. And to say that I've, I've been able to run that race and, and run in NASCAR now and, and so many late model races and, and done all the stuff that I've been able to do, it's just, 
it's just such a blessing. It's, it's such a whirlwind uh, for me to have the opportunity that I have now to represent a company like Diamond Gusset running the truck series and potentially run the full year. It's just the whole thing is just so beyond anything I could have ever dreamed. Uh, you know, it's I've been very blessed. That my, my family's been so supportive and been able to support me. And, and I've never run from that. I've always thought that was kind of weird mm-hmm. in NASCAR, how so many of these young guys are clearly getting – their their families involved in, in the money that goes into their racing programs and, and it's like they try to hide that in the press releases and I've always just kind of rolled my eyes at that I've never understood it you know the thing is is like I've never been offended by somebody getting the opportunity because their family had money like unfortunately guys we're in racing you got to have money to be able to do this like it's just not a poor person sport and that's that's just the hard facts of it it stinks and I don't like it but that's kind of where we're at. And so I just think I've always just been really thankful that my dad has been able to put any money, not a whole lot of money, good grief. It's not like we're, you know, Ralph Fenway racing or anything. <laughs> we're a small team. Don't get me wrong. But we've been able to have enough money to kind of get the ball rolling. And we've been able to hopefully impress enough people uh, to drum up a little bit of sponsorship and, and kind of keep the ball rolling down on the hill. And I think this year has been – as, as big of a struggle as it's been for us, it's also been a blessing because we've been able to see tremendous improvement through our team and, and also me as a driver. I just feel like I'm getting better every day. That's awesome, man. You know, one thing you mentioned was that uh, you were uh, watching stock car racing. One thing we like to ask everybody, who was your favorite driver, either growing up or now or in the in the cup Kyle, Pe- Kyle Petty was my favorite driver. Kyle Petty, all right. a boy. Uh, I, was, I, was a huge, I was a huge Petty fan. Uh, my dad loved the Petties. He, he loved Richard Petty. That was the guy he loved. And, and I just naturally fell into loving Kyle Petty uh, because of that. And, and also, I think Kyle Petty had the coolest paint schemes of any driver I've ever seen. He had the two, literally two of the top five paint schemes, in my opinion, in the history of NASCAR. Kyle Petty drove the cars, and that's the Mellow Yellow car for Felix Sabatis. Oh, yeah. Two. Trickle. <laughs> and... Uh, yeah, and then the Cole Trickle, yeah, right, exactly, like the Cole Trickle car, basically. And then he also drove the Hot Wheels car, that 44 car. Oh, yeah, which I, I remember that car. Just yeah. an awesome-looking car. And that's actually one of the reasons that I ran the 44 in late models, and, and now that we're getting to, to run it in trucks is because of Kyle Petty. Well, that's cool. That is really cool. I think before we, uh, and I don't want to chase a vein too hard, but what you talked about, about coming from a family of money, uh, that you shouldn't apologize for that if that ends, you know, if that ends up making your career as a racer. What we tend to ignore, or at least society tends to ignore, or at least race people aren't paying attention to, is that it's actually the same thing in baseball now. Uh, there is so much money poured into travel teams for trying to get these kids into college scholarships and uh, and eventually to Major League Baseball as as their wishes. That like you you have to be. You have to be wealthy to play travel baseball. So it's not just NASCAR. But I want to segue into the question I want to ask you most about racing the truck is what has been the most challenging experience sitting in the driver's seat for you, and and why was it the most challenging experience? Uh, you know, are, are, are we talking about just like career wise? Are we talking about the trucks this year, or I'm talking about an in the moment? Like you're you're a race car driver, you're trying to get a finish, and something comes up, and and you have to try to manage it to the end and and get the best finish you can. What? Uh, yeah. How did you process all that information and then try to execute a plan? You know, quite frankly, I think I stink at that, and, and you know, this is it's funny you bring this up because I, I feel like. Um, I had a race earlier this year where I really did a bad job. And, and I can sit here, and I told our, our crew that, and I, and I told uh, my dad, who is the team owner, and I told him, you know, which, by the way, he's my dad, but at the racetrack, he's the owner of the team. Right. And there's, there, is a, there has been no distinction there uh, made more clear uh, than he's going to do what it, you know, the best thing for the team there. Um, I'm just very blessed that he thinks I'm a good enough driver to, to sit in the seat. But I told him I did a bad job in Atlanta. Uh, we had a right front tire go down on us about 20, 25 laps into the race. And we wound up having to make a green flag pit stop. And it was a deal where I felt something wrong. Um, and we had just gone a lap down. We were really struggling. We were really tight. And we had just gone a lap down. And rather than saying to the crew on the radio, hey, I think we might have something going wrong, um, our spotter had just gotten on the radio and said, okay, we have three minutes until the caution clock. 
and I said, okay, we can make it. We can make it, you know, five or six laps, you know, and I just, that was me making that call rather than making that a team call. And then sure enough, uh, the tire went down. We had to pit under green. We wound up losing a couple more laps and, and it really just basically killed our entire day, um, right then and there. And then after that, yeah, I was driving the car, but I think mentally I kind of checked out of it a little bit. You know, when, when you're sitting there four or five laps down, and you know there's really nothing that you can do to get back on the lead lap, that, it's really tough to keep yourself in the game mentally. And I think I did a bad job. I mean, I'm not sitting here saying that I just stunk it up. I mean, I still went out there and drove the car, but I think I could have done a lot more. And I think I could have gotten a lot more out of it. Um, and maybe got us a lap back or something, and maybe got us back in it. But instead, I think I just essentially – was letting some guys go that I probably shouldn't have let go just because we were a couple laps down instead of kind of fighting for track position more. And, and I told the team afterwards that I'm not going to do that anymore. You know, we're, we're there to race and we're there to, to race hard. And, and I want to be known for that. Yeah. Well, I think I knew when I asked that question that it was, it was, it would potentially lead to where we're at now, which is why we asked it first, because we want to always bring the conversation back up but <laughs> i really appreciate the candid response um i think that's something that is going to be endearing to people that love to watch racing and people that would potentially be your fans so that's pretty cool hey, well man i <laughs> i think every race car driver uh, and this isn't just me it, 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 i guarantee if you ask parker kligerman or rico abreu or matt crafton or you know any of the guys in our series and man we got a lot of really good drivers in the series by the way this year it is by far we picked the worst year to start a race team in the truck series <laughs> in the history of the truck series just about if you look down the row of teams and drivers in this thing this year there's so much talent in this series and, and so much um support from big teams it's you know it's as competitive as it's ever been um, but if you ask every single one of those guys, they would tell you they're the bit, that they are their own biggest critic. Um, so I don't, I don't think I'm alone in that sense. Now, they probably aren't going to get out of the car and get on TV and say they stuck it up like I would. But uh, I, trust me, they're going to be their, their harshest critic uh, by far. Well, and, and I mean, as the learning opportunity and stuff and, and the self-realization of that, I think that's very cool and certainly mature for a driver especially, but uh, what uh, Tommy, let's bring it up some. What's the coolest thing you got to do because uh, you're a race car driver that maybe didn't happen on the racetrack, but but have you gotten into anything, uh, Nito? Have you thrown the I'm a race car driver card anywhere? <laughs> oh, gosh. Yeah, man, I try to, I, you know, I, I hated self-promotion. <laughs> like, I think that's why I did so crappy back in 2014, and quite frankly, I was a really bad driver for our team. We tried to go run the Xfinity Series in 2014, and we did a really bad job. And, and I'm saying that organizationally. Um, we got some, some equipment that was not very good. Uh, we hired some guys that had been involved with me in our late model program, and, and look, and I'm not talking any bad about them at all, uh, but they, they just didn't have a whole lot of knowledge about the Xfinity cars. They kind of went into it learning and for me it was a new experience learning and it was just kind of a disaster but what i was saying mainly in getting to your point which is like what was the you know throw the race car driver card around i don't think i threw that card around at all back in 2014 like i didn't do any sort of like promotion for the team or myself or anything um and as you guys have seen now i'm way more active on twitter and yeah i'm you know very blessed to be invited on shows like with you guys and, and hanging out. And it's it, what I kind of realize is that this is part of the job, like that I'm supposed to be doing that. And, and, and I don't have to do it like really corporate or like, really like, please go to gusset.com and buy jeans. Like I don't have to, I don't have to be a robot about it. I can have fun with this and just enjoy the opportunity that I've been given, which is an amazing opportunity that people would kill to have. And I just need to enjoy it. And promoting it and talking to people about it, they want to talk about it. It's not me being mean. It's not me being like a big-time guy. It's just fun. And I think kind of coming to that realization that I can, you know, talk about myself and talk about racing and talk about our sponsor and it be okay and it not be me basically being an asshole, <laughs> I think that was a big realization for me sure. to kind of get over that hurdle. Sure. Well, I mean, we certainly appreciate you wanting to talk to us, and, and I think that the relaxedness with which you're willing to talk about 
you know how you came up and the experiences you had is that's really cool it's just really neat things for us to get to hear as as hosts of a racing fan podcast i mean to be honest with you absolutely yeah well, i mean you guys you guys are part of the reason we get to do this like it's guys like you it's it's guys that are fans of your show it's it's like that's the reason that i'm able to sit in a car and have a company like diamond gusset jeans want to sponsor it like that's the whole reason for it and and I, I just think, quite frankly, I'm old. <laughs> like, <laughs> I'm old. I don't know if you guys looked around in the truck series, but we've got like 16-year-olds and 17-year-olds and 18-year-olds racing in the truck series. I'm 29, and I've been kind of kicked around. I, I consider myself like one of the big kind of knock-around guys in NASCAR, like where everybody would say, oh, Tommy Joe Martins, who the heck is that? You know, who is that guy? And that's fine to me, like being an underdog, uh, the biggest thing that I look for is just respect in the garage area. You know, I think if, if you've got other team owners and other drivers that say, you know what, actually, you know what, that guy might not be in the best equipment, but that guy's getting it done. Like to me, that's, that's been my goal. And so coming back this year and, and getting to do this again, that's kind of been my approach is that I want to get the respect from other guys and I'm not afraid to hang out and promote myself and promote the team because I think the guys that we've got on our team and our sponsor, we, like they are just kicking butt all the time. And I want to talk about them as much as I can because they deserve it. Uh, they deserve all the praise. And I'm just a lucky guy that gets to hold the wheel. That's awesome. Uh, Tommy, when you're not driving uh, in the uh, in the truck series, what are you doing outside of that? What are you doing for fun? Yeah, we already know what your job is. So what, is your, <laughs> what are your hobbies? Okay, yeah, yeah, right. Um, okay, yeah, right. Well, the thing is, is like my other job, is still driving cars. So, like, that's what I do here in Vegas is I work at Ron Fellows Performance Driving School. Really awesome. The official driving school at Corvette. And I've been fortunate to work out here for the last year and a half, and it's been just an awesome experience. So, basically, my routine is I leave the racetrack, come back to Vegas, teach people how to drive Corvettes, fly back to the racetrack and race. Like, it is basic. Like, if you had told the 14 year old version of me that this is what I would be doing at 29, <laughs> I would have laughed in your face and told you that there's no way that I could be making money doing this. And the fact that I'm getting to, it's, it's still funny to me. I'm sitting here laughing about it right now. Like it's still just, I feel like somebody's playing a joke on me and somebody's going to like, I'm going to get a call and go, Oh, just kidding. You're fired. And you're fired again. Oh, you're going you know, like to show up to work one day and somewhere. Ashton Kutcher is going to say you're punked. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's coming soon because I, I just, you know, it's again the opportunity. I, I, the one thing that has been my biggest gripe uh, with some of the guys that have been the big stars in our sport, and, and I'm not naming any names or anything, but I just feel like sometimes we lose perspective on just how good we have it. And I am driving for a small team. Don't get me wrong. Uh, like, are we a top five contender? Most of the time, probably not. Are we a top 15 contender? Yeah, I think that's probably about where we're at, top 15, top 20. And just to even have an opportunity like that is just so awesome. And so I'm happy as a lark. So when I see some of these other guys that are getting out of rides that are, you know, really, really top-level teams and they're mad and in bad moods and they don't want to talk to fans and stuff like that, it just makes me really roll my eyes. That's kind of a big pet peeve of mine is like, I just don't think everybody understands how good we have it. I think the fans know how good we have it. And I think sometimes <laughs> we're so involved in it, we're so focused on, on doing well that we lose track of just how awesome it is to even be involved in the sport at the level that we're involved in it. Yeah, that's really – I I love the commentary. I really appreciate it. And we kind of want to wrap it up with one, with one more quick question. Your Your day job is teaching folks how to drive the, the new – ZR1 or the Z06 Corvette they just bought that they probably for most of them they've never been in a fast sports car before and you're teaching them how to go right and left in a stock car <laughs> what do you like the most doing do you like driving on an oval or do you like going right and left Ooh you know that's that's good because I've only I've only been right and left in a stock car one time it was up there at at oh boy Bob, this is going to be funny. This is like almost blackmailing myself right now. <laughs> like nobody go look at the results from Road America in 2014. Like please don't go look at that. 10-4. In the NEXFET series. 
because that is embarrassing. Uh, the car we brought up there was like a generation one COT car. It was really old and it was really crappy. And my team would say the same thing. And we were like seven seconds off the pace or something. And we were basically wheel hopping in every corner. I still had fun, but we were just so terribly bad that basically anybody that would look at that would be like, this guy's an idiot. I'm not going to go learn from this guy. This guy doesn't know what the heck he's doing at all. Uh, but I enjoyed it. I think, honestly, for me, though, uh, the most fun I can have in a car, I really like restrictor plate racing, man. I really do. Maybe I'm one of the weird people that really likes it, but I really like it. Like I like Daytona. I like Talladega. It's a lot of fun to me, and it's always been a dream for me to race at those tracks. So every time we go there, I think, man, I could go win this thing. And I, I maybe I enjoy the, the chaos of it. Uh, whereas I think a lot of people, it kind of freaks them out, but I, I like it. Um, so for me, that's, that's always the place that I'm looking forward to going. Well, that's a great lead in to this weekend's race for sure. Or this weekend's race is, so we really appreciate you coming on, Tommy. This has been a very fun conversation. Absolutely. We're looking forward to the next time too. Oh, thanks a lot, guys. Yeah, for sure. I'd love to be back on. Well, folks, uh, his next race is at Kansas in the Toyota two uh, Toyota Tundra two fifty. A lot of T's there. A little alliteration for you. You can follow him at at Tommy <laughs> Joe Martins. And Tommy, anything you want to uh, plug for us? Promos at the very end. Uh, you know, you guys go check out my sponsors page. You know, I know that's the easiest thing to plug, but go check them out. Diamond Gusset Jeans, made in America. It's an awesome pair of jeans. I'm not just saying that because they sponsor me. I'm wearing <laughs> a pair right now. They're really comfortable. They're really well made. You're going to like the product. Go check it out, gusset.com. They'll give you a good deal on some really American-made jeans. It's a great product. And you know what? We might not be on TV every minute. We're a smaller team. But everything that you guys are sending to me, like Twitter and Instagram and Facebook and all that kind of stuff, all those messages that I'm, I'm getting, from all the fans uh it has been so awesome and i just can't thank you guys enough for supporting us uh a small team and a really big sport and it all just means a lot to us so thank you and thank you guys for having me the love goes both ways my brother so for sure we we appreciate it and we'll uh we'll look forward to the next time you take care of yourself all right thanks guys <laughs> bye dude how cool was that i mean i say that every time we talk to somebody but that yeah. it. That was so awesome, that dude. Cool Tommy was Christmas. so much fun, and he drinking would, his drinking his roommate's Bud Light. <laughs> yeah, drinking his roommate's Bud Light, and he's willing. Like he expounded on every. Like we didn't have to ask every question that we had because he provided yep. content and like the presence that he had to to do that shows you that he's got an awareness about him that that fits the mold for a race car driver. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know the last uh, last driver we had on here, Ryan Ellis. He uh, went ahead and got himself a cup car, so looking forward to uh, you know maybe we'll be the maybe people be knocking down our doors to come on the PETM podcast uh, if old Tommy Joe gets him a little success here, and uh, you know the the old rabbit's foot being on the PETM podcast. Yeah, well there won't be a bigger fan group uh, than us when Tommy hits the track again. Uh, we're going to be pulling. That's what's so much fun about doing some of this stuff that we're doing is that you, you get an exposure to people that you wouldn't normally have a chance to get exposure to. So while mm -hmm. we would love to support the up-and-coming guys, these guys that sort of in, in maybe not in a limbo perspective, but they're just in a place where they don't get enough exposure from a TV perspective or like the daily show perspective, we can provide an opportunity for them to talk to people talk to race fans that really love the sport, and, and it's so much fun to do it. Yeah, yeah, a boatload of fun. Um, I think that takes us on to uh, let's let's talk about some news this week. Um, starting with uh, lug nuts, that brings us to the lug nuts segment, and that's the end of the lug nuts segment. All hope right, you, hope you enjoyed it. Yeah, pr uh, appreciate everybody being here for the lug nuts segment of the PTM podcast. Uh, we did have uh, Tony Stewart come back, which was very cool. It was it was awesome. How should have been the story. Yeah, should have been the story. Uh, it was awesome how quickly he went from a non-story to a uh, front and center story. Like on Wednesday, I think it was Jeff Gluck posting about how 
how, uh, well, here's an update on Tony. He's not sure yet on when he's coming back. Blah, blah, blah. This is going on, you know. And just a good update to have. Yeah, like, it was like Wednesday morning he yeah. was getting a back scan. And they're yeah. like, this may go a long way to telling us when Tony's going to be back. Yeah, not if, but, uh, you know, when uh, in the timeline of things. And then Thursday we get from Tony, coming back. It was, that was so cool. There's my goosebumps. Tony Stewart. Get him every once in a while uh, on the podcast. There's the goosebumps. So yeah, that was uh, that was cool as crap, uh, and he's back in the car, um, running the fourteen, and uh, you know he had a I guess he had a not so great weekend, but uh, still I mean I think he was uh, especially afterwards, and they were talking to him, and he was real comfortable in the car. He was real happy to be back in the car, and um, you know I don't know what to say. I'm you know you have to root for him. He's Tony, man. We only got we were only going to get thirty six races. And then his injury took, what, nine of them away from us? Eight or nine away from us? Mm-hmm. Um, so, uh, I, as a selfish race fan, like, I'm glad he's back because I want to see him race. Like, because I'm only going to get to see Tony Stewart race, like, 24 more times. Yep. And then it and then it's over. Yep. In my favorite racing series. So, as a fan, I'm very selfish. Like, I wanted him back sooner than later. I'm glad that his health progression has allowed him to do that. And I, I wish him the utmost success. Like, I rooted for Jeff Gordon last year to ride off in the sunset with a championship. I will do that this year, even if it costs my favorite racer his first championship. Sure, sure. So let's move on to Richmond. How about them races at Richmond, man? <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> I'll tell you what, if you didn't like Richmond – you're probably going to need to find something else to do with your time. Or have somebody explain why you ought to have liked all of that. Because, I mean, that was, uh, once again, you know, I'm going to use the word quintessential. <laughs> but Quint- Quintessential in terms of cars were able to use the entire racetrack yep. to get their job done. And we know that that is the best way that ty- that drivers can manage what their skills are, which is, I know how to make this line go this fast with this amount of gas and this amount of brake, and it only uses this much tire. And we know that at Richmond, we're going to have to run probably around 105 laps if mm-hmm. it goes green the entire fuel run. And and they have to sort that out. And so, I mean, that's what we got. We got, we got that for the most part. I mean, the end of the Xfinity race was yeah, maybe – not exactly what you wanted, but it sure as hell wasn't a green-white checker. We got, what, six hard green laps to finish yep. her up? Yep, and Dale Jr. at the finish. Uh, you know, we can talk again about about cup guys in the lower series or in the Xfinity and Truck Series, but um, I don't know that there were a whole lot of people that were PO'd about that finish either. I can't imagine there was very many upset people. If you if you right. count all the fans and say how many were upset that Junior won on Saturday afternoon, it, it's it's not the same number of people that are pissed <laughs> off when Kyle wins it's on Saturday a, afternoon. More of a Kyle deal for sure. So, um, you know, one thing I I had, I had texted you too about the uh, and if we, if we're moving on to the Cup race and we're moving yeah. on especially uh, the finish, but I mean all throughout again. It, it, it's another week in a row. So last week at Bristol, I said, you know, man, Bristol, I thought was the best race we had had all season. Uh, and very personally speaking, it was the first one where I was really glued to the television every single lap um, or glued even in person. I, I felt like there were a few laps at Atlanta that me and you just kind of zoned out on. But every lap at Bristol. And then once again, the next week, uh, every lap at Richmond. I mean, I'm just glued to it, watching it, and and not not turning away. I mean, when commercials come up, I'm running in the fridge, go grab another beer. Uh, it was just a great race. I thought it was a great race too. Uh, I think the only thing that made it maybe not the greatest race of the season so far is that Fontana was so good. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and and in Texas was pretty good. Atlanta was pretty good, but and Bristol was great. But I think. And Martinsville was like, I, I don't. I so mean, you I run out of you run out of superlatives, all right? Yeah. So if we look at Jeff Gluck's poll, and like he's hitting like seventy seven, seventy five, eighty two, seventy six, ninety two percent, 
every week, it's obvious that the change NASCAR has made to these cars has made it something that we like better than what we used to see. As much as I love night racing, mm-hmm. if running during the daylight means that these cars can spread out across the entire racetrack, I'll get over the fact that I love night racing. Three wide restarts, four wide restarts at Richmond. We're talking they, about they survived track? an entire corner at a three quarter mile racetrack, four wide. Right? Yeah, so, so that's impossible. <laughs> that's impossible. First like, off, it's, physics. It's kind of like the, what they say about hitting a fastball. <laughs> yeah. If you just do yeah. the math, it's impossible to hit a fastball. Well, they hit a fastball, and they did it a couple of times, mm-hmm. and and nobody wrecked. I mean, in the Xfinity race, people are going to bitch about how you know the 48 team that was already a slower car stayed on old tires and made a mess and it caused an issue for guys that are contenders uh guys like justin Allgaier. but in the cup race we didn't see that because nobody was dumb enough to do that right and, and i forgive the 48 team for making that decision they i mean you're you're trying to get points i get it you just that was probably not a good idea but in the cup race, they went four wide through turn one, like, I don't know, maybe five five or six different times. Especially on and the made it, And yep. made it work. Like, did we just turn Richmond into the small version of California? And if we did, <laughs> is that not the awesomest thing ever? Yes. Yes, that's exactly what that is. I think so. I, I mean, his hands off a little bit. There's a good I'm pretty again. sure that's what just happened. Yeah. We turned Richmond into the small track version of California. California has been the best race on the circuit for about for four years, years yep. now yep so i i don't even know what else to say about it it was yeah. i uh, mean and how that, well we got to talk about the end for a minute well sure for sure, sure. so um but i mean i'm not trying to close you off if no you no, no. Get some no. filler in there uh, well I, I don't have any filler other than i was on the edge of my seat and uh, at the end uh, me and you texted back and forth and it was what two laps ago and we said well this thing's over um, uh, bummer that we didn't get to see a great finish. We <laughs> both totally <laughs> miscalled. I mean, like, I'm so happy to be wrong about what we said. Yeah. Because, I mean, we've been dinged before by a couple of different people about talking about Ty Rose and Jeff because during the Car of Tomorrow era, Jeff couldn't figure out the tires. Right. And I think most of the fans will harken back to the 90s where, where Jeff was probably as good as managing tires as, any, as anybody was. A lot of reason why he won those races. He got real bad at it at one point. And, and we accused Carl of that because it looked like just Carl was just wasn't – he was not closing the gap. You know, five, four, three laps to go, he wasn't closing the gap. All of a sudden, yeah, there's nothing two do. laps to go, and he's there. He's there. Now, I don't know. Was that was – that- um, Kyle Busch kind of taking it a little too conservative, or was that I, – I couldn't tell, but it looked like Kyle Busch was holding – I don't want to say holding back because uh, he ain't never holding back, but um, what was the difference between those two laps at the very end and the five laps that preceded that? Well, in my mind, without knowing what the guy sitting in the driver's seat holding the steering wheel is saying, mm-hmm. I think – Yeah, let's speculate. Yeah, I think, <laughs> I think Kyle Busch was probably on the conservative side. Mm-hmm. And he probably never expected his teammate to hit him. Yep. And so he took the line he thought would be the best to run for his car at the time. Yep. Instead of saying, I have to be aggressive, and I'm either going to take the bottom line and make him square my bumper up and hope that I can steer right to go left better than he yep. can, or go way wide and say, look, we can door jam all the way down, but that start finish, as you know, at Richmond is not in the center of that D oval. It's way down towards turn four. So it happens really fast. As soon as you get off the corner, bam, you hit the start finish. Yeah. So even if Carl's able to get up and door him, you know, like we saw with Kenseth and Casey, when he was a rookie, you just can't, there's nothing you can do. If you're the underneath car, there's nothing you can do. Yeah. Yeah. You Problem just get out, run after Kyle four. ran the second groove. Which yep. left Carl every option available. He's like, I can outbreak him and get into him, or I can drive it too deep and use his car to slow me down and move him out of the way, which it was some combination of those two things. The classic bump and run, too. And, but it was, I mean, if we look at it. Respectfully. 
<laughs> Very respectfully, Kyle only lost one position. Yep. Now, Kyle Bush fans were going to bitch till the day is done that that one position matters more than anything. Yeah. But as a racer, it matters a lot. The other 40 or, excuse me, 38 drivers that were out there watched that happen and said, well, Carl may or may not have made a decision I would or would not make. Yep. Depending on what my situation was. But what he didn't do is he he didn't cost Kyle Busch a race car. And he didn't cost him but one position. Yeah. So. It was it, a great move. I mean. It was a great move. If you can get me to respect something Carl Edwards has done on a racetrack. <laughs> well, that's that's true. Where I'm at. That's true. So, I mean, and you can, you can attest. <laughs> I can attest. You can sure. attest better than anyone. Yeah. If you can get me to respect something on a racetrack that Carl's done that some people won't respect, then that kind of should tell you where I'm at with it. Like, okay. But so the question that I would have asked, and I don't want us to chase the white rabbit, but if the 18 is the 20 who isn't locked in doesn't have a win yet mm-hmm. does is Carl still willing to make the same move i think he is i think he 18, is the 18 is his teammate but, uh, he's going to do that right, but, if he's going to do that against his teammate for the win he's going to do it against anybody the 18 has two wins going in is that something you're thinking about i guess we're both teams. i mean if we're going to accuse Carl of being a cerebral race car driver then we have to be willing to say that he knows moving Kyle is not as big a deal as if he moved a teammate who doesn't have a yeah. win. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know how the balance works within the I think JGR yes. scope. I think yes. If you, if, and this is all heat of the moment, because think about it. We're coming down last lap. You're trying to chase the guy down. You haven't been able to chase him down the last three laps. All of a sudden, you're on his bumper. Uh and you have the opportunity to win the race? Hell yeah. Hell yeah, he moves him. I think so, too, because here's why. Carl has been consistent with his opportunity to win a race. Mm-hmm. We saw at Kansas, what was that, back in 07 or 08, yeah. where he dive-bombed Jimmy Johnson and did, yeah. the, and did the video game move. He yeah, the video. Called it, he the video. called it. Yeah, that's he what he said. He went in there, and he's like, I just hope I bounce off the wall the right way. Mm-hmm. And Jimmy just didn't work. Blowed up, <laughs> watched Carl hit the wall, and <laughs> yeah. drove underneath him and won the race. Yeah, and that was, I think, Jimmy's fifth championship in a row or whatever it was. Yeah, I mean, Carl had uh, easily two car links on him, but he had it heading straight into the wall. <laughs> so. Right, there was no way he was going to make it turn. Yeah, and just no chance. <laughs> There's no e brake in a stock car. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> even if there was, it probably wouldn't have worked. <laughs> right. So I, uh, yeah, great race. Very much enjoyed it. Great finish, and everybody did what they needed to do. Um, I think I picked uh, Joey Logano, who had a terrible day all the way up until the finish, and I think they were saying with about 15 laps to go, like, and Joey Logano is cracked the top 10. What in the world happened there? So uh, that was uh, a strange comeback. Uh, who'd you pick? I can't even remember. We can't never remember on this thing. Uh, I <laughs> picked, terrible. Test. I picked Dale Earnhardt Jr. Oh yeah, oh that's a that was a great pick. Yeah, it, um, wasn't, it wasn't a bad pick. He ended up actually Casey passed him late, so he finished uh, ninth, I think. Ninth, okay. And I don't even remember where uh, where old sliced bread finished, but it don't matter. Uh, I think sliced was thirteenth behind Chase. Okay, or was he better than that? He may. He, Better look if we're going to judge who we're, how we're going to pick. You oh, I don't look. care. Because let me. Let's they rebounded you. well, but they were they they were ebbing and flowing late. Yeah, yeah. Ah, uh, let's uh, heck with it. We'll go, let's give you the the first pick because we're going to Talladega. We are going to Dale Adega. Dale Adega. <laughs> yep, going to Talladega. Uh, plate race. Um, I have uh, personally boycotted the last, I believe, two uh, Talladega races, and I'll be honest with y'all, there's a Taco Fest here in Atlanta, Georgia, and I may have bought tickets. Well, our esteemed producer, the Frizz 11... We're going to talk after the show about how I'm going to the Taco (laughs) Fest and uh, bringing our friend Courtney with us. Oh, very nice. Uh, But yeah, we're... uh, 
we're going to the taco fest and so we're going to be eating some tacos and uh catching the end of that race but um you know i i i get a little more invigorated when i hear somebody like tommy joe who we talked to earlier saying that he loves the plate race and it's like oh man well maybe i need to I need to go back and reevaluate my whole ordeal on that but i don't know it's i don't know tough. i don't know it's tough you know what? Uh, Talladega is one of those, and me and you've been. To I want to go to Talladega Boulevard and enjoy what that is. Yeah, but we haven't been able to do that because when we went down there, uh, the weather was terrible. We picked the perfect terrible year, and I think we can go back down there and have some fun. But what happens on the racetrack is 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 a challenge for me to process, and so uh, until someone who's well, everybody's more intelligent than me, but until someone <laughs> can explain it in such a fashion that brain, my brain's like, oh, yeah, I can't miss that race. I can't not watch that thing. Until somebody's able to sell me that story, I'm probably going to the Taco Fest. Going to the old Taco Fest. You know what's funny? We have a beer fest the day before, so we're going to the Roswell, Georgia yeah, we do, Beer which Fest. Which means we're going to miss on Saturday. both races. And then on Sunday, we have the Taco Fest. So that's just going to be... That's going to be a hell of a... It's going to uh, be fun as hell. Hell of a Monday, but... Gonna either a whole way, lot of what you're drinking. Let's do some picks. You ready? Yeah, let's pick. Start your boy, You got us started. We've actually had some good uh, commands lately, too. So, shout-outs to the folks doing the, uh, doing the commands to start the races. Been working out pretty well. I have very much enjoyed the calls to fire i've probably been more critical than i should be about the anthems but <laughs> uh, i'm hashtag sing the damn song that's mm. where i'm at well sherwin give us your picks who you got um, uh well let's, let's just start with you know saturday uh let, no let's start with uh, we don't pick xfinity very much so. no let's start with uh, uh talladega i mean do it and we'll do a sunday my number one sunday. a gold bet it in vegas pick yep all right, well, Dale Earnhardt Jr. and company are bringing Amelia back to the track. They repaired her, Ooh! so I I can't resist the urge to take Dale Earnhardt Jr. and company and Amelia, because Amelia is fast as hell. Yes, she is. <laughs> yes, she is. Great pick. Um, I am going with, well, recent, well, obviously the team is doing great, and uh, recent kind of... Uh, Plate track standout. I think we. I know you were going. Denny Hamlin. We may have to fist fight. <laughs> <laughs> going with Denny Hamlin. In the. Uh, All right. Well, so we. we there. Is this where we go into the dark horse? We do. We go into the dark horse. Don't pick my dark horse because I. I don't really have any reason that I did other than the reason that I did. <laughs> um. Let me. You know what? I'd like to be a nice. Have, have a nice fun dark horse. Uh, I tell you what, I'm going to go with the front row motorsports, Hello. uh, Chris Busher. Wow. Wow. We know that Chris they're Busher. good at massaging those bodies because David Reagan won one of those races <laughs> a couple years ago that we were at. Yep. So I'm going to go with them. Xfinity champion, Chris Busher. Yes. So very cool. I like it. Um, I, I guess I'm boring. I picked Austin Dillon. Uh, for my uh, for my dark horse, um, what? It, uh, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> I in the format that it's in, boy, it'd be way more fun to pick dark horses uh, if um, if we had the tandem racing here. I'm just saying, tandem racing rules. Uh, Tandem's way better than what we got. Yeah. So hashtag tandem racing. Hashtag tandem racing. You gotta like that. All right. Uh, what else, dude? We've made our picks. I don't Lock know. Lock them in. We chased everybody, Vegas. just about everybody away from the Periscope, unfortunately. But That's all whatever. right. We had some fun with them. We did have some fun. <laughs> Let's. Uh, we may have flicked them off. That might have been what it was. <laughs> it could have been. We invented us a new handshake. <laughs> I'm going to bring this up. You know what that means. It's about time for the Jelly Bean Closeout Challenge. Ooh, I'm going to have Ooh, a I'm sip. Gonna, oh, she's going to have a sip. Let's uh, stuff a whole bunch of jelly beans in my mouth oh, here. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Jelly beans. PTM jelly Posse. bean closeout challenge. That was Love y'all. The PTM Posse hanging out with us every week. Hey, y'all be sure to get your sticker if you're a new listener. Free sticker. Yeah, good. I'll sticker. hold it up right here. All you have to do, email us 
DM us, tweet us, whatever. We'll send you one. We pay for postage. We pay for the. Well, Sherwin pays for it. Well, I do. Yeah, <laughs> that's mostly me. But uh, pay for the stamp, pay for the uh, envelope, pay for everything. All you got to do is just tell us you want one, and then send us a picture where you put it, and you'll be on the wall of fame that we have. Reminds me, I need to go ahead and print off some more of them. But oh uh, yeah, we need to get Kenny a big sticker. I I've been uh, that's right. I've been laying down on that. I'm sorry. Um, oh Whoa, my God, that was good. One. Sherwin's playing with the fart putty there. Yo, um, hey, there's new episodes of Top Gear America tonight. You know who the host of Top Gear America is, right? That's old Rutledge, ain't it? Rutledge Wood, who we met all out of City, Georgia. Yeah, uh, met him out at Atlanta Motor Speedway. <laughs> that fart putty's going to get fart you in trouble. Fart putty's got the runs, man. Yeah. Oh, man. And, um, yeah, so um, Rutledge Wood, y'all be sure to watch him at... I can't remember which channel it's on. It's on like uh, history or something like that. Um, anyway, one of them weird ones. One of them weird ones. Cheers to uh, cheers to Johnny Football. Johnny. Oh Bleepin. yeah, Johnny Bleeping Football <laughs> got indicted. That yeah. guy sucks. <laughs> yep. Might as well just have fun with that. Why not? Um, thank How you. How about to- old Graham Rahal acting like a a hole after the race <laughs> with the? I- oh, sorry. Uh, any car was at Barber Motorsports Park. They, uh, that was actually a very good race, very good finish. There was some controversy, which that sometimes is going to happen. And they did a bump and run, which is totally NASCAR as hell. Y'all be sure to follow us. Uh, first off, follow Tommy Joe Martins. Thank him for being on the show at Tommy Joe Martins, M A R T I N S. And we're uh, the PETM Podcast at PETM Podcast. I'm Tailgate Mayor at Tailgate Mayor. I am pregame engineer at pregame ENG. And we will talk to y'all next week. Thanks for hanging out, y'all. Ooh, about to come off the road.